Uh, well, welcome everyone to uh, Church Online today. Uh, it is so wonderful to have you with us and a really special welcome to those who have joined us uh, online over the last couple of months. It is really, really great to have you with us and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, there are ways you can reach out and connect with us um, linked below this video. Uh, but again, welcome if that is you. And we want to say a special welcome today to Lola Raitt, newest member of our PBC family. Congratulations, Murray and Nat. Hey, we've loved hearing um, stories of the ways that you've been meeting together to watch church online in homes. And um, if you're able to host others in your home to watch church together, then go ahead and invite them. Um, if you're not sure who to invite or you'd like to be a guest in someone's home, contact Steve and he can hook you up. Yeah, the, the important thing, though, is to remain connected. Um, as you know, the restrictions uh, continue to ease uh, in our state of what is possible. And from July 1, uh, some of that cap has been lifted uh, on churches gathering, except that the four square metre rule still applies. Uh, for us at PBC, you might not have realised this, but that means we can have no more than 50 people uh, in our auditorium uh, at one time. And yet we recognise the significance of gathering together, uh, even to do church uh, online. And so from July, uh, we'll be facilitating three gatherings across Sunday of no more than 50 people uh, to come and view church online. So obviously this will be a little bit different than normal. Uh, for one, you'll have to register ahead of time and let us know, uh, reserve your spot at, at one of those. That'll be at 8.45, 10.45 and 5.30, so as not to confuse uh, us all. Um, there will be no singing, uh, unfortunately, or maybe maybe fortunately, depending on your personality. Well, <laughs> hey, Travis sat next to me when I sing. He knows that I sing like um, a tractor. And I'm missing it. Um, <laughs> uh, we won't be sitting too close to each other, though. There'll be 1.5 metres uh, remaining between us. Uh, and obviously, we'll have no uh, morning tea uh, at this time as well. Uh, so obviously that's not going to uh, be able to facilitate uh, all of our church community uh, meeting together in person here or on site. Uh, so we really strongly encourage you, uh, if you're able to, to be meeting up with other people to do church online um, over the weekend uh, in homes, uh, whether you can host or, or go and be part of that, that's a really good thing to do. Uh, but for those who actually uh, need to, or it's really important to be able to come together here or on site, uh, do be aware that those opportunities will be available from July. Uh, and make sure to um, book in early to avoid disappointment. <laughs> so that is the plan for now under the ever-changing government easing of restrictions. <laughs> yep. um, the other thing that we really want to encourage you um, to do is to jump into our Moving Forward Together survey. The reality is for many of us, COVID has caused us to hit the pause button in our life. And um, there are many activities that would have otherwise filled our weeks that we stopped doing. And for some of us through this time, we've, we've come out reflecting that that's, there's actually been some real positives in that. There's also been some really hard things through this time. And so what we'd love you to do is to just pause and reflect. What are the things that have been good? What are the things that have been hard? What are the things that you really want to take forward with you into the future as restrictions ease? We really believe that this is a valuable um, reflection, not only to do personally, but a conversation to have with others. If you're in a small group, have it as a small group conversation. Have it with others in your family um, or those that you're close to. We just think it's really valuable to just pause and reflect in this moment. So you can find that Moving Together questionnaire um, below this video and also in our e-newsletter. E uh, but for now, why don't we move into a time of, of worship together from, from right, right where you are. And we want to thank our Angie and the band for leading us in this time.
my privilege to uh, lead us all in prayer right now and as we do that I'd like to begin by reading just the first three verses of Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. 
out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you are a God who hears, you are a God who listens. Lord, as we've come together today to wait in your presence, we thank you so much that you remind us here that you turn to us and you hear our cry. And Father, I thank you too that you have said here that you lift us out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire, and you set our feet on a rock. And so Lord, as we come today to pray for those amongst us in particular who have such big needs at the moment in our body, Lord, I thank you that we can rest assured that you are quite able to lift each one of them out of the situation they are in, to give them the strength to stand firm and to feel that um, firm ground beneath their feet and to know your loving arms around them, lifting them out and enabling them to stand sure and firm in you. And Lord, we lift up today to you any who are um, just so concerned and perhaps don't quite know where to turn uh, in the area of finance or job situation, or perhaps they're worried about their family in these situations. Lord, we pray that you will be the provider for each one of these folk. Lord, that you would show them the way forward. You would meet their needs in every way. And Lord, you would lift them, the burdens from them. And that you would give them the hope that they need to know that you will set their feet on solid ground again. Lord, we pray your blessing on each one of them, each family going through difficult financial situations right now. We bless them in your name, Jesus. And Lord, show us ways we can help them too as needed. And Lord, our hearts are heavy too when we think of some in a hospital right now undergoing hugely difficult procedures or um, battling through very severe illnesses. Lord, we don't know what to do, but you do. And Lord, we pray that you will bring your healing, bring your supernatural healing to these ones amongst us who need it. Lord, that you would also give the doctors wisdom and strength and insight, everything they need to um, work wisely, Lord, and to bring your healing to these ones whom we love and that you love so much more too. Lord, be close to each one of them and to their families. Lord, just to settle their hearts and their spirits. And Lord, remind them that they belong to you, that you are a God of love. You are a God of power and strength and of healing and that you are able to provide all that they need at this time. Lord, give those who care for them just a settled place in their spirit where they can be with you and rest in your arms again. And Lord, I pray too that you will remind each one of us um, to watch out for each other in this time. Lord, show us ways to help and to care for each other even more than we might be doing now. And Lord, use us to um, just minister your, to your love and to grace, grace to um, those around us in the body and to those outside as well. And Lord, strengthen our pastors at this time too who are aware of all the needs that we might not be. Lord, uh, provide for them. Lord, settle their hearts and their spirits. Strengthen them in you. And Lord, watch over them. Watch over us all in this time. And we thank you, Lord, that we are your children. We belong to you. We can trust you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Greetings to you all. Our Bible reading today comes from 1 Peter chapter 5 and I'm reading the whole chapter from verse 1 to verse 14. So it's 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 1. To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, 
not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power for ever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to all of you who are in Christ. And this is God's word. I don't know if you ever remember what it feels like to be humiliated. If you can't, probably because the humiliation wasn't a very bad one for you. For me, the worst years of my life were probably years seven and eight at high school. And it was because of the bullying I experienced. Um, I was bullied emotionally, I was bullied physically. And there was one kid in particular, he was a couple of years older than me, he was in year 10. And he, like he had a doctorate in humiliation. He knew how to humiliate me and he said things and he did things that, that were just aimed at humiliating me. Now, I still remember the things that he said and I still remember the things that he did. I still remember the laughter that he would get from those around me because, like, humiliation is funny, right? Yeah, it is when it's not happening to you. So I, I just got this question for you. Why is it that we know that humiliation stinks? Like, it's just not a good thing. And yet, why is it as Christians we think that humility is a good thing? Because, right, humility and humiliation are really, like, they come from the same word. They mean the same thing in many ways. So why is it that humiliation stinks, but humility is something to be desired? Humility was actually not always seen as being a, virt a virtue. So when Peter wrote his letter that we've been working through, the Greek and the Roman culture actually treated humility and humiliation really consistently. They actually saw them both as terrible things. They were both to be avoided. Humility was not seen as a virtue, but humility was something, it was a characteristic that was despised. If you were born into a position of power or influence or status or wealth or, or all of the above, if you had that position in society, you would not lower yourself by being humble. It would be seen as degrading or disgusting for you as a person with that kind of status to actually lower yourself to the standard of someone below you. You just don't do that. And in these days, the, the Roman, when this is written, the Roman emperor would never show humility. It would not be expected of a leader to show humility. That would be a disgrace. The Roman emperor was never wrong. The Roman emperor always got his own way. The Roman emperor would crush dissent. The Roman emperor was accountable to no one. The Roman emperor would not show humility. 
and neither would it be expected that his governors, his officials or his military leaders would as well. But when we come to this final chapter of Peter's letter, as he wraps up his instructions to the Christians, this is what he asks the Christians to do. He says, be humble. You, you Christians who are chosen by God, you are his elect. You Christians who are sons and daughters of the kingdom, who have this inheritance that can never, ever be taken away from you. It's kept for you. Live humbly. He uses this image of clothe yourselves with humility in your relationship with each other. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And in a culture that made no distinction between humility and humiliation, Peter says, live differently, live humbly. Humility became one of the defining marks of the early church. Christians were unmistakable in their counter-cultural embrace of humility. Uh, to everyone else around them, this made absolutely no sense at all. But to Christians, it was the only way to live because of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is the theme of Peter. Know what Christ has made you to be. You are his chosen ones. You are kept for this inheritance for you. But don't only know what he has made you, live like him. Jesus is the one that we are called to live like. Central to the good news that, uh, that, that was preached by Peter is the death of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't just any death, but it was crucifixion. And when it came to humiliation, there was no greater humiliation in the Roman Empire than suffering death by crucifixion. If you were a Roman citizen, it did not matter what crime you committed, you would not be crucified. You would not suffer that humiliation. Many Jews refused to believe that Jesus was the Messiah because in their head, God would never, ever allow his Messiah to be crucified. God would never, ever allow his Messiah to suffer such a humiliation. But Peter and Paul and the early church, they don't shy away from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It becomes central to their preaching because they knew that the death of Jesus Christ revealed to them and reveal to the world that Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah. And as Christians, they understood that in following Jesus, they were called to live humbly. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul speaks about this and uh, he starts off the passage by saying this. This is from Philippians chapter 2. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then in verse 6, we have some of the earliest recorded words of what would have been a chant or a hymn. Uh, we didn't know whether they said it or they sung it. But the early church had these words at the very beginning of their meeting. So before Paul writes this letter, he's quoting from this saying that the Christians would know. And it goes like this. It says, Who being in the very nature God, talking about Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And the song goes on. For the early church, following Jesus meant following his example of humility. This was not weakness, but this was obedience, and it was the only possible response that they could have to God's grace. It was born of their conviction that all men and all women stood equal before God, created by him, loved by him, and all were invited to place their faith in Christ, to receive the grace, the love, and the forgiveness of their heavenly Father. And this is why Peter calls them to humility. When we go back to chapter 5 of 1 Peter, he starts by addressing the elders. Now, the elders were not the old people in the church. Uh, the elders were those who were the leaders of the churches, those with spiritual authority. And he starts with them because humility is so vital for those uh, in spiritual leadership. 
But when we come to this passage, I don't want you to read it and go, oh, that only applies to pastors and to elders. Don't limit it to that. It, it, it applies to everyone with spiritual oversight or spiritual authority or spiritual influence over others. So don't limit it uh, to, to paid pastors or appointed elders. Uh, apply it to those who have spiritual authority, whether it's paid or unpaid, official, unofficial, in a church context or in other contexts such as family or school. At the beginning of this passage, uh, you may notice that Peter humbly calls them to be humble. I really like that. He humbly calls them to be humble. He says, I'm not going to command you, but I appeal to you as a fellow elder. Well, Peter was a fellow elder, but like he, his credentials were a little bit more than that, weren't they? He was also an apostle. He was one of the three who really knew Jesus the best. He was the one uh, who Jesus said that he would build his church upon. And he was the one who Jesus personally said, um, commissioned to shepherd God's people. But Peter appeals to them as a fellow elder and he says, lead like this. Uh, firstly, lead because you're willing to, not because you have to. That's good advice, isn't it? If you're going to have spiritual leadership over people, lead because you want to, not because you have to. And he picks up this image of the shepherd, uh, this shepherd uh, image that Jesus used so often. Uh, a shepherd knows his sheep. A shepherd loves his sheep. A shepherd will lay his life down for his sheep. Leaders, says Peter, first of all, be motivated by love, not duty. I remember uh, I would have been in my early 20s and I was exploring ministry, getting more involved in church. And I remember somebody saying to me, he said, look, when it comes to Christian ministry, always remember the two most important things. And I said, yeah, what? And he goes, love God and love the people. And that stayed with me uh, for, for many, many years. Love God, love people. You know, in ministry, we learn skills. In ministry, we get to sharpen and hone our spiritual gifts. But those two things stand above all, that we are called as, as leaders, as spiritual leaders, uh, people with spiritual influence, to love God and to love the people we serve. And so small group leaders, that's what I call you to do. I want you to be motivated by love, not duty. Uh, youth leaders, kids church leaders, call you to do the same thing. Be motivated out of love, not duty. Love God and love the people you serve. If you're a pastoral carer, same applies to you. Love God, love the people you care for. If you're a pastor, whether you're a deacon, it's the same thing. The most important thing that we do is that we're motivated by love. Love God and love the people we care for. Lead because you're willing to, not because you have to. But secondly, Peter says, lead by serving, not for seeking gain. Now he's not accusing the elders of fraud and nor is Peter saying that those with spiritual oversight shouldn't get paid. But again, it comes back to the motive. Uh, the, the danger in ministry, the danger with having spiritual influence or oversight is that it becomes what we get from it. Influence or power or status or a, just a sense of approval that we get. There's a passage that Mark records in his gospel where James and John, they come to Jesus and they ask him for the best seats in the kingdom. He said, one of us at your right, one of us at your left. And Jesus says, no, no. And he gathers the disciples together and he says this to them. He says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And that was completely true. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Lead because you're willing and lead by serving. And thirdly, Peter says, lead by example. You see, a shepherd doesn't drive the sheep, but the shepherd leads them from the front and calls them to follow. And Peter says to the elders, live lives worthy of imitation. You know, this is what the disciples did. They spent time with Jesus. They listened to him, but they also watched him. They imitated him and their lives came to imitate those, that of Jesus. And as pastors, as leaders, as teachers, as parents, we've got to remember that others watch us. You know, they listen to a little of what we say. But above all, they see what we do. And so let our lives be worthy of imitation. 
as Peter goes through, he turns his attention now uh, away just from the elders, from the spiritual leaders, uh, but he, he, refer, he, he speaks to those who are younger and he says, submit yourselves to your elders. And this is their response of humility. As your leaders lead you in humility, then respond to them by submitting to them with humility. And, and then Peter goes broader again. He says, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility, humble yourselves in the midst of persecution. Trust in God. Cast your anxieties on him. And then he wraps up this letter by saying, stand firm in the faith. Be alert to the schemes of the enemy. Stand firm with all your brothers and sisters in Christ who are experiencing the same. Remember, you are not alone in what you're experiencing. And then he finishes just with this beautiful promise. He says, you are called to an eternal glory. So whilst you suffer now for a little while, our God will in his grace restore you and strengthen you. It's not easy to live humbly. It's not a natural thing that we do. It doesn't just happen. And everything within our culture tells us that we need to not live humbly, but that we are to promote ourselves. Everything in our culture tells us that, you know, let's not worry about other people because we're the most important person in the world. Everything in our culture tells us that we have to look after ourselves first. Everything in our culture tells us that we will only be happy when we follow our dreams. And my observation would be that fewer and fewer of our role models in leadership see humility as a virtue. Our leadership role models are increasingly looking like that of a Roman emperor. Uh, we used to call such people tyrants or dictators, uh, but a new name over the last around about 10 years has developed with these kind of particularly political leaders. Their name is the strong man. The strong man gets their way. The strong man is never wrong. The strong man crushes dissent. The strong man controls or bullies the media. The strong man makes the laws. The strong man determines the facts. The strong man rewrites history. The strong man is accountable to no one. And we used to see the strong man in countries that we would never want to live in. You think of places like North Korea as an obvious one and, and other countries. But increasingly, the strong man has not had to take power by force because we're voting them into power. Increasingly, our role models don't see humility as a virtue. And so it's not easy living humbly. And as we finish this series up, there are just two things that I want to uh, encourage us to do. To live humbly, firstly, we need to understand our identity in Christ. Really simply, we are made by God, we are loved by God, we are brought into his family through our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is all of grace. This is all undeserved favour. And because it is all undeserved favour, there is no place, no place for pride. Simply worship and gratitude. And there is no place for self-loathing, for a low self-esteem, but simply to trust God for who he says we are. To live humbly, firstly, we must understand our identity in Christ. But then secondly, we need to practice it. We actually need to live this out in the everyday life. We need to practice humility. And so seven things, I think most of them are self-explanatory and you can unpack these and think about how they apply to you. But these are just seven things um, that we can practice to actually practice humility. The first is to love and accept all people regardless of what they look like, regardless of their education, regardless of how much money they have. We are so quick to make judgments of people. Often we look at someone and we judge them simply by what we see. We need to practice seeing people as God sees them. A second thing, a second way to practice humility is to do this, to practice being, uh, to practice admitting when you're wrong or when you've done something wrong. Uh, now this is not a male thing, I've heard that said. Uh, I just think it's a people thing. We don't like it when we are wrong and we hate admitting when we're wrong. So we need to practice it. When we make a mistake, when we do something wrong, quickly admit it. Apologise if you need to. Practice being wrong. And can I just say to those of us who actually when somebody comes and admits that they're wrong, our response is really important. You don't want to go, sorry, 
sorry, I, I, I can't believe I heard that. Can you say that again? Did you say you are wrong? Right? That doesn't help at all. We need to be humble in our response when people humbly admit that they're wrong. Thirdly, be prepared to learn from other people. Uh, often we just think we can do life the way we want to and we're going to learn it all our own way or we're only going to learn it from special people that we think are worthy to learn from. Uh, we need to be prepared to learn from all people. Fourthly, uh, be willing to listen to others more than speaking to others. This is a preacher's curse, isn't it? Be willing to listen to others more than speaking to others. Be conscious how well you listen. Are you actually interested in the person who's talking to you? Are you listening to what they're saying or are you just waiting for your opportunity to talk about yourself? Uh, fifthly, be more concerned with your integrity than your image. Is that not self-explanatory? Be more concerned with your integrity, not with your image. Um, be more concerned to make sure that your words and your deeds match up than developing the perfect profile. Sixthly, um, practice giving honour and credit to others. It's really nice to receive a compliment for someone, but when it's been a team effort, um, give credit to those who don't get seen. Give credit and honour to others. I've been encouraged by just the feedback that people have been giving regarding our online services and it's, it is, it's really encouraging. Um, but understand that the people you see up front are just part of a team that is much broader uh, than the people who are up front. Um, ben is recording this again, Ben Wilson. He's been here every week I've been doing this. An absolute legend, done a great job. So when you send an email this week, send it to him, not me. And lastly, be satisfied that God sees your good deeds, even if no one else does. You know, when you do something that's really good and nobody sees it, that kind of sucks a bit, right? But humility is actually being satisfied that God sees it and God, cause God commends what you've done. Sometimes we go to a lot of effort and it feels like that we don't receive the credit that we should have. But again, humility says, I did that for an audience of one. I did that above all for God. The good news of Jesus Christ is the story of our divine Saviour who, motivated by love, humbled himself by coming to us as a man and dying in our place that we might have life. And like Peter and like Paul and like the early church, our response to this is not pride, our response to this is not self-loathing, but our response to the good news of Jesus Christ is one of humble obedience and worship. And this, as we live this out in the everyday of life, will be unmistakably beautiful.
Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us online today. And, and thank you, Steve, uh, for that message. Uh, a great way to actually wrap up our series through the letter of 1 Peter. Uh, it's been challenging and encouraging and, and hopefully inspiring as well. Uh, we trust you actually, actually feel better equipped to follow Jesus uh, with or without the support of culture, uh, having spent the last six weeks through 1 Peter. Uh, next week, we're going to start a, a new series called uh, Living a Different Story. Uh, and it positions us really well to think about maybe some of the changes that we can make uh, coming out of this time of social isolation. As we think about, as Jesus followers, what does it mean to live in a way that is countercultural uh, and yet all about the kingdom of God? Yeah. And thank you to everyone who continues to partner with us in the work of the gospel through PBC. We are really thankful to God for his provision. If you would like to know how you can give, um, details for that are below this video. God bless you and have a great week.